Okay, so in the previous lecture, we saw how we could derive the Cauchy Schwartz inequality when we are looking at vectors in three dimension, right? So there it turned out to be a result which was not a surprise, right? So, but we came up with a method, right? We outlined a geometric approach, which something similar can be used to generalize, you know, the the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. We can get a generalized version of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality for you know vectors drawn from a linear vector space. Right? The moment a scalar product is defined, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality will come into play, and uh, you know the way to obtain it is analogous to the method that we use to get to the Cauchy Schwartz inequality with three dimensional vectors. So that's the subject of this lecture. Okay, so we consider some vector z, which is a linear combination of two vectors x, y, right? So as always, like in the previous, uh, you know, lecture we saw, we took two, two vectors a and b. So likewise, we are taking, uh, you know, two vectors x and y, so generic vectors, right? So there will be some special cases, you know, where x is related to y in a certain way, or if it's a null vector, these are all special cases, which you can think about you know separately but let's say that these two are you know generic vectors x and y and we take the special linear combination x and y right i mean in general we could have put some arbitrary coefficient here but we already have this um, you know uh, wisdom from hindsight or we have used it and then we saw there that there was some nice uh, result that could be extracted by considering you know this a dot b so we'll consider the inner product of y x we'll already put in put in an inner product y x i mean there was a geometrical interpretation which we gave for why we went about considering this particular vector so uh, you know to get to an inequality we are going to use you know the one inequality which is sort of encoded in the definition of inner product right so that's that's where the any other you know interesting inequality is going to come from the fact that uh, you know every inner product of every vector with itself must be greater than or equal to zero that's what we're going to use but we are going to first of all try to get a you know some nice linear combination of two vectors which is like here and then invoke uh, the property that we care about okay so Okay, so let's restrict alpha to be some real number. So if we take the inner product of z with itself, what do we get? Okay, so if, if, if you take the inner product of z with itself, you have this inner product of x with itself minus uh, 2 times alpha times yx times xy, right? Why does this happen? Right, so you have to work through this carefully, right? This comes from the fact that alpha is, is, is real, right? So if I do inner product of z with itself, so when I take the, the bra vector z, alpha is going to remain alpha there's no alpha star because it's a real number and then but y x will become x y right you have to carefully work out this uh, algebra and then you will see that you have x x minus 2 alpha y x x y so you're going to get x y here and the other one will come from you know uh, You know, you, you get yx times xy and xy times yx. Doesn't matter. So you can combine a couple both of them. You'll get minus two times alpha times yx times xy. And then you have the final term, which is plus alpha squared mod of xy the whole square times yy. Right? All of this you will have to 
convince yourself by working through this. Right? You have to do the algebra. Not very difficult, but already there is an application of the properties of the inner product are already used here. Now comes the uh, you know the property that of non-negativity of a scalar product of a vector with itself. So if you just apply this, so we we have this you know this entire quantity must be greater than or equal to zero, and then we write it in terms of as as a quadratic expression in alpha squared, right? So now we recall that alpha is some arbitrary number for any value of alpha, any real alpha, this condition must hold, right? So we will, you know, write this uh, as a quadratic expression in alpha. So you have alpha squared minus 2 alpha times some coefficient plus some other coefficient must be greater than or equal to 0, right? So now we will complete the squares. So you have alpha minus 1 over yy, the whole squared, and then since we have got an extra 1 over yy squared, we are going to subtract that and then you have minus 1 over y y squared here plus this other constant must be greater than or equal to 0. Now this must hold for any real value of alpha. For any real value of alpha, this quantity here, right, y y is a real number, alpha is a real number, the difference of two real numbers is a real number, the square of a real number is going to be real and positive, and right, the sum of a positive number with another quantity which must be greater than or equal to 0 for any value of alpha. So this can happen only if this quantity itself is greater than or equal to 0. Right? So therefore it forces this quantity must be greater than or equal to 0. Now if we rearrange these terms, we have the cauchy schwarz inequality, which is the statement that the inner product of any two vectors, x, y, the modulus square of the inner product of any two vectors must be less than or equal to the product of the inner products of each of these vectors with themselves, right? Inner product of x with x and inner product of y with y, the product, this product is going to be greater than or equal to the modulus squared of the inner product of these two vectors. Right? This is a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality which has, you know, very beautiful applications in many fields of mathematics, right? And it appears in, you know, when you're studying complex numbers, it appears in uh, all kinds of contexts. So let's look at a few examples where, you know, drawn from within, you know, the theory of vector spaces. So we have seen that we, we can think of uh, the set of complex numbers as a vector space, right? So with the operation of addition being the usual addition of complex numbers. So, and we also define a scalar product z1 uh, z2 which is just going to be z1 star z2 it's a legitimate scalar product so if we simply uh, impose this cauchy schwarz inequality to this scalar product right so so it's important to to realize that the cauchy schwarz inequality is is very general and it will hold for any definition of a scalar product as long as it's a legitimate definition of a scalar product you must have all these properties corresponding to the scalar product satisfied and then it should work out. So look at what happens here. So for this case, it turns out that this inequality becomes like a trivial equality, right? So why does this happen? So you have z1 star z2, the whole squared, mod of this squared is must be less than or equal to z1 star times z1 times z2 star times z2. But the right hand side and the left hand side are the same for any any two vectors z1 and z2. So there is, it's never going to be a hard inequality. It's always going to be an equality, right? So it's uh, it reduces to an equality in this particular case. Now, but there are other cases where it's actually quite a um, you know it's a strong result. For example, if you have n complex numbers which form, you know, we saw that n column vectors form a uh, linear vector space. I right? consider any two such vectors. We also said that. You know, there is a legitimate inner product which one can define as x dagger y. You take the row vector corresponding to x, multiply with the column vector corresponding to y. You know, you are multiplying all these complex coefficients. x, And then the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality now says mod of x dagger y, the whole squared, is less than or equal to x dagger x times y dagger y. Right? So explicitly, if you want to see this, 
let's say you have a you know you have two column vectors like x and y you know x1 x2 x and all the way up to xn they're all complex coefficients right so and y1 y2 y and all of them are also complex numbers arbitrary complex numbers so what this result says is it doesn't matter you just you know you have some n arbitrary complex numbers here and another n uh, arbitrary complex numbers you if you tie them up in this particular manner this inequality necessarily holds right so x y x i y i you add them up take the square of them and so this must be necessarily less than or equal to summation of i over i mod of x i squared the whole thing times summation over j mod of y j squared right so this product this inequality can be derived you know directly by other methods but the, the beauty is that we have this very general result and it finds application in all these particular cases and then of course we have seen one example uh, which is the familiar result of euclidean vectors where the result simply reads as a dot b the whole squared is less than or equal to a dot a times b dot b right so there i mean we we saw that this was simply a consequence of the fact that cos squared of theta is always less than or equal to 1 right so it doesn't seem like a big deal but the point is that this has you know this power of uh, application in a much more general context and in fact one can combine these ideas right cos square of theta is less than or equal to 1 implies the um, uh, or is seen to be equivalent to the cauchy schwarz inequality and so you can use this as a way to define a cos theta between any two vectors in an RB, in a uh, you know in an abstract vector space right so maybe we will look at that in another uh, example but the point is that so there is this analogy which one can make right i will just make that as a statement but maybe we'll go into it elsewhere and so that's all for this lecture thank you